Well, in today's video, we're going to take a look at hydrogen sulfide, an oil field hazard. And this is in our series on how oil fields work. So we're going to start off, what is H2S? Well, depending on where you live, it's either hydrogen sulfide or it's hydrogen sulfide. What it's really known for is the smell of rotten eggs. And this was a talk that was given, I gave many, many years ago. And at the time, uh, these were some of the rotten eggs that were around. Dirty Den and Nasty Nick are probably long forgotten by many now. Also, there is a culinary speciality, uh, cooked rotten eggs. I can't think of anything worse. And also, uh, we're kind of known stink bombs, but, you know, there are lots of compounds that can be quite smelly. And quite a number of these actually do contain sulfur in them, but there's everything in here from captains through hydrogen sulfide all the way down to uh, some of the aldehydes and amines can also smell, but lots of different compounds. And, and many of these can be found in crude oil. Now, what is the issue? Well, it's really to do with the health and safety challenges. Now, if we look at the toxicity of hydrogen sulfide, it's comparable to hydrogen cyanide. 100 ppm could mean immediate danger of death. 15 parts per million, well, short-term exposure limit anything more than that and, and gradually the victim may be dying and the reason for that is the olfactory receptors in the nose that tend to get paralyzed at around about the 100 ppm h2s level so you simply can't smell it and even at lower levels there tends to be a, a fatigue where essentially we stop noticing the smell of it and and that's when it can be very very dangerous indeed in terms of the refractive index, it's very close to air, so it's it's very difficult to see this gas. Not only that, but when hydrogen sulfide gets into your eyes, it mixes with the aqueous solution there, and it forms an acid, which it causes irritation to the eyes. It should also be noted as well that the explosive limits, both the lower explosive limits of only um, 4% and the upper limit of in the order of 46%. This means that hydrogen sulfide is in an explosive mixture, which is a lot broader than some combustible gases that we use all the time. So very difficult to look out for. And a bit more detail, and, and these are taken from the HSC guidelines, probably a few years old now, but uh, hopefully they wouldn't have changed too much. And on the left there, you can see the parts per million from very, very, very low levels there. It, it's actually 4.7 parts per billion. A lot of people can actually smell that. Not 50% of people can detect the odor of hydrogen sulfide at that sort of level. And then as we move on up there, I won't read all those. Pause the video and have a look if you want more information. The engineering challenges, well, not only does hydrogen sulfide kill people, it's also, it's heavier than air and it usually falls to low-lying, poorly ventilated areas. So if that is on a platform or even out in the desert, if there was a, a trench or something, the gas could find itself into the trench. A worker steps into this trench to do some maintenance work and just drops dead. And it happens. When mixed with uh, lighter-than-air gases or at high temperatures, it, it can rise. It doesn't necessarily fall all the time. Hot gases rise, but then when they cool, they'll start to fall again. In terms of ignition, well, it will auto ignite at 232 degrees centigrade. Well, a lit cigarette is a 700 degrees centigrade, so anybody smoking the vicinity of hydrogen sulfide will cause an explosion. H2S tends to burn with a blue flame and it produces sulfur dioxide, which in itself is poisonous, uh, very irritating and, and causes a lot of coughing. It's also very corrosive to metals and it forms metal sulfides. Characteristically, if you see tubulars that are dark brown or black, that can be an indication that they've been exposed to hydrogen sulfide gas. Now, when we try and measure it, H2S, if it's just collected in regular you know, steel containers, then this paper that's referenced down at the bottom there, these authors showed that we could have a reservoir concentration. And in some cases, there's some absorption and also some reaction with, with sample chambers, which means that the concentration of H2S that gets measured actually declines over days. So if you suspect hydrogen sulfide, there are special chambers that are lined with non-reactive material so that you can actually get a good measurement of, of hydrogen sulfide concentration. Now, um, one of the interesting things is that in an oil and gas setting, 
you may have different parts of the plant. And, uh, and here's a sort of a diagram of all the parts of a production system. And in some parts, you may only have in the produced water or the water injection side, there may only be uh, some quite low levels. But as you look around the plant at different areas, you can see that the level of H2S can vary within the plant. And in this specific case here, that if you are post-amine plant and before incineration, in this particular process, it was showing that the uh, H2S concentrations would get up to 42,600 ppm. You know, a minor leak from that part of the plant, there would be uh, fatal consequences. Now, one of the areas in the world, and indeed within the North Sea, where there is quite a lot of issues with H2S, are in the Outer Murray Firth, and this is quadrants 14 and 15 of the uh, UK continental shelf. And uh, you can see these are some of the oil fields here. And this isn't a very good slide, but it shows sort of uh, in the red boxes, you can actually make out the occurrences of the aerial distribution of H2S measurements in this region. It's clearer on some of the following maps. So here you can see that if we look in the Outer Murray Firth, you know, the leak formation in Athena has got 4% H2S, Lowlander 1.6, Perth 0.65%, and that's mole weight. And you can see here are some, some other examples of fields where H2S is recorded. And bear in mind, you know, we've been talking about 100 ppm being fatal. Now, when we compare that international, well, here are the outer Murray Firth. So, you know, really, these levels are very, very low. And, and you can see here in the Aquitaine Basin in France, in the United Arab Emirates, here the Shah Field. This is the uh, Ram River field in Alberta. Prinos, we'll have a look at in a little more detail. It's a field in Greece. And you can see that even at Bohai Bay in China, up to 92% of the gas that's being measured as being H2S. So, you know, there are some issues to be addressed and some engineering solutions to be found when we're talking about high hydrogen sulfide gases in the North Sea. But compared to other parts of the world, they pale into insignificance. Well, not insignificance, but they are significantly reduced. So uh, talking about Prinos, and here's a picture of Prinos, what's kind of uh, significant about Prinos, it's offshore in Greece, and uh, you can see here that the complex of, of platforms. The, the other thing, being Greece, being a very, very hot country, you know, generally there are periods of time in the summer where you'd have very little wind, and you can see here the seas are very, very calm. So were you to get a leak in this environment, this cloud of gas would actually hang around the, the platform. In some ways, if you had the scenario where you had strong winds blowing, it would actually disperse the gas quite quickly and take it away from the platform. Despite that climatic drawback, Prinos has operated for many decades and has been very, very successful. And certainly at the time that I did this study, there weren't any major incidents recorded. They've got a good safety record. Another area which needs to be understood is the souring of oil fields. Now, how this comes about is that in terms of secondary recovery or pressure maintenance, then a lot of oil fields would actually start injecting the sulfate-rich seawater. So all seawater contains quite a, a lot of sulfate in it. And, of course, down in the, uh, the Earth's crust, there is no oxygen. There's no free oxygen. But as soon as this sulfate-rich water gets introduced, then there are certain bacteria, the desulfovibrium bacteria, who will actually go in and start chomping away on the sulfate ions and, and actually take the oxygen out of there. It tends to be when the water gets injected in and it starts to rise up towards formation temperature, there seems to be a band. It's thought in the literature that, you know, that's sort of between the 45 degrees centigrade and the 80 degrees centigrade, there is this development of gases. Now, I think at higher temperatures, the, the expectation is that uh, this activity, the bacteria won't be able to resist, but there have been some thermophiles which are shown to actually operate at higher temperatures. And, you know, if we look at the field, the former field in the uh, the northern North Sea, up in the Brent province here, the thistle field, you know, here's some of the wells and you can see that some of the values of H2S that were recorded uh, actually get up to the order of 3000 uh, ppm.
I mean, I, I was on the platform when we were conducting a, an operation on one of the wells, and there was a very, very strong smell, even out in the fresh air on, on an open deck with a, a fairly stiff breeze blowing. So, yeah, it is something to be considered, but it's generally managed, and there are scavengers in place. There are ways of, of managing the H2S. It is common in mature water floods. And the souring phenomenon is defined as the increasing mass of H2S per unit mass of total produced fluids. Sour can be anything above 3 ppm. And bear in mind, you know, that's well above the limit that most people can actually start to smell H2S. Now, there have been some called barotolerant and thermophilic bacteria that have been found. And above 80 degrees centigrade and, and also down at sort of 9,500 psi. But... We don't really have a huge amount of data and information on those. Not only H2S, but also CO2. And really, here's a look at the H2S and CO2 levels, again, for a number of these uh, fields, which I think people will recognize who, who've worked the, the North Sea Basin. You can see these that not only do we have orders of magnitude difference in the concentration of hydrogen sulfide, but this on a linear scale here, you're seeing the carbon dioxide content. Now, carbon dioxide in itself, you know, we call this acid gas. It tends to be called acid gas because if it mixes with water, it forms carbonic acid, and that can be quite corrosive. So if you find the gas in pools of water, say, uh, at the base of pipelines, that can actually start to corrode flow lines and, and various low points, often low points in, in, in export lines, etc. Uh, so you can see that there are different challenges with, with some of these fields. But again, you know, there are ways to engineer a solution. So uh, this graph here is just showing you that there are two apparent families here of, of sort of the high H2S, high CO2 with the lower H2S, lower CO2 levels. But when you actually plot that on a linear scale, it's not at all obvious where these two families are. Where does the H2S come from? Well, there's an ongoing debate, really. On the very left here, you're talking about the sulfate-reducing bacteria like disulfovibrium, and, and this is five micrometers. So these things are tiny, 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 only being seen with, a, I think there's a scanning electron microscope here. Is the origin from minerals and, and you know, evaporites, particular anhydrites and uh, gypsum, sometimes thought of as being the source of the H2S, although it could also be associated with the organic matter interacting within the, the evaporitic rock sequences. The volcanic origin, well, very obviously, here's blocks of sulfur uh, coming from this vent. So if anybody's been near to these, you can kind of sense the burning effect of the uh, SO2, the sulfur dioxide, but also you get that smell, that rotten egg smell, which is the uh, hydrogen sulfide. The role that source rocks play, I mean, obviously, they are a source of a lot of hydrocarbons, but also a lot of sulfur compounds, cyclic compounds, and, and very complex organic molecules. There is the, the Black Sea model, where you've got 80% of the deeper waters here are anoxic, and we have these black smokers and reducing environment. And then this is the ocean anoxic events. Now, I think this is the event up here. You can see this upwelling of fluorescing sort of planktonic material is what we're looking at this is something else this is actually just the sand being blown off the uh, namib desert some of this winds up in the rainforests of brazil and other parts of latin america so um, what about a mantle or volcanic source well if we look here at the outer murray firth region we can see where all the fields are and the levels of h2s that have been recorded in, in some of these fields highly variable but the major crustal features if we can call them those associated with these major faults at the top zechstein level they don't seem to be particularly associated with some of the higher levels of H2S. Also, there doesn't appear to be any sort of inert gases, the nitrogens, argons, heliums, neons, that we might associate with sort of mantle origin gas. So it doesn't seem that there's a, an obvious correlation. Now, um, we do know that the outer Murray Firth is the failed limb of a triple junction, the mid-Jurassic breakup of the North Sea region. 
And this is the failed arm. So this is the backwater. This is the region where perhaps the H2S has developed. And it's not really widely known or a major feature in, in either the Viking Graben or the Central Graben or for that matter across into Denmark, Norway or the Netherlands for that matter. In terms of source rock uh, geochemistry, well, this is a sort of summary here for uh, one well. It's the 1418A9 well, which is also uh, known as Bordeaux as a discovery and features in our, our Trove database. You can see here, here's the lower Cretaceous. And then from around about 7,500 to 8,500 feet, you've got the Kimmeridge clay before going into the pipe of sands, which were the, the reservoir. And uh, what you can see here is these are various uh, gas chromatograms going through the Kimmeridge formation and you can clearly see that there is apparent biodegradation that's been going on you know possibly associated with the influx of meteoric waters even though this is a very very thick shale sequence unfortunately when we get down into the the reservoir sands here We've got this contamination of this low toxicity oil-based mud, and you can see that, that uh, that's dominating the system through there. So we don't really get a good indication. But in terms of the total organic carbon, I mean, these are the samples that were taken. And, and as you get into the Kimmeridge clay formation, you know, you're getting up to 6 8% total organic carbon in here, dropping right back down into the Triassic. So as the source rock is a contender for the source of H2S, well, you know, sulfate-rich groundwaters percolating in may act as a feedstock for the sulfate-reducing bacteria. And can we correlate those with the highest concentrations of hydrogen sulfide in the Outer Murray Firth area? Well, again, you know, here's the distribution of H2S. The map here is the base Cretaceous unconformity. I believe it was Parkmead who actually produced this map. And what you can see here, here are the, the major tectonic features that are identified in the area. So the high concentrations tend to be in these regions associated with this sort of light blue color, again, at base Cretaceous unconformity. So a, a top Kimmeridge clay formation approximately. So it would appear that these might be the zones where we're actually most prone or most likely to be generating H2S. Some of them not quite as well constrained, but if you draw in these areas, they seem to explain some of the areas where it's very, very high. So it's very interesting that within this area, there are lots of fields which have not been developed in the main. And in fact, quite a number that have been known, appraised, and really haven't moved forward to development because it is difficult. There are challenges. But when you look together, these numbers here add up to just shy of a billion barrels of oil in place. Very little oil has been recovered to date. Some oil was recovered from this sort of the hydrogen sulfide rich hot lenses of the now defunct Tartan platform. But, you know, the solution will come along. It is only a matter of time. And, and perhaps what the solution is, is some sort of central, perhaps standalone uh, development where all of the hydrocarbons in the region get tied back and processed at one central area. And, you know, this is certainly something in and around the Perth area would be a, an obvious candidate for that. So what conclusions? Well, we can't say definitively what the source of hydrogen sulfide is in this region can't be discriminated uh, from the available data, but the tectonic setting is that the outer Murray Firth is within this isolated, this sort of backwater, the failed arm of a triple junction. And that may account in part for the anomalous setting and the occurrence of, of sour gas. There's no evidence I can see that there's any close association in this region with a mantle origin, uh, nor for that matter, a close proximity to any sort of evaporites. There are a few occurrences, but, but not, not that many at all. Uh, high concentrations of hydrogen sulfide are found in close proximity to mature source rock. And one of the things that is cited is that where you have short distance migration, that perhaps you get higher preservation of H2S from the maturation of source rocks, of kerogen, conversion of kerogen. But if you have a longer uh, migration distance, you know, the, there is a school of thought that says that the H2S will react on its way through the carrier beds, through the reservoirs, and, and it will tend to be lower. There is some evidence of, uh, that kerogen in the immature 
Cambridge clay formation, source rock, has, has been biodegraded. And I think that was illustrated in some of those gas chromatograms we saw earlier. And, and that's despite the fact that these are very thick shale packages. We often see a stratigraphic component to H2S uh, distribution, which isn't, again, well understood. Is it down to connectivity to, to local source kitchens, or are they just sort of isolated sands in the late Jurassic? They tend to be some of the youngest and most isolated sands in the region. So a couple of odds and ends. This is a photograph that was sent to me by my friend uh, Jerry Coglin, and Jerry took this when he was visiting the Centrica office in Calgary. This is a freight train just uh, rolling through downtown Calgary, and you can see that these wagons here are actually full of sulphur, and this is native sulphur that's actually come from the oil fields, and this stretches on for quite a distance. I don't know how far to the left we have to go before we get to find an engine or so. Then finally, another odd one here is it's just to kind of draw a distinction. I mean, just because you've high sulfur in the crude it does not necessarily mean that you have hydrogen sulfide. What we're talking about with hydrogen sulfide is it's the gas that's in the gaseous phase. You can still have an oil that's got lots of sulfur in it and it's not necessarily associated with high H2S. And that can be seen here. So this is uh, some data that came from Wood Mackenzie and uh, probably best part of a, a decade ago now and you can see on this axis here we're showing the concentration of hydrogen sulfide and on the x-axis we're, we're showing the concentration of sulfur in the crude and there's not a particularly good correlation between the two so they can be very very different things so high sulfur crude oils can be very very different to high hydrogen sulfide gases associated with it Back in the day, these were some of the guys I was working with. This was a project that we did for Parkme Group and uh, some of the individuals involved in that. Uh, thank you, guys. And also, this is a dedication to the people of Chongqing in China, onshore China, shown on the map there, where on the 23rd of December in 2003, there was a blowout of a well. It was up on a hillside, and it was a blowout of hydrogen sulfide gas and it happened at night and during uh, the night a cloud of hydrogen sulfide descended down the hill into a nearby village uh, all the people were asleep and uh, it ended up that there were 243 fatalities and 13,000 people were affected by chemical burns or some partial poisoning uh, as a result so um, hydrogen sulfide it is a hazard one to be aware of. Thanks very much for watching. Please like, subscribe and ring that bell. Look forward to having you back on our channel soon. Bye for now.